Welcome back to Customer Tech Talks. I'm your host, Ben Walters, and today I'm joined by Kwai Dow, who've been working in the medical diagnostic space for more than 40 years. But before we jump into the interview, let's take a look at the video. Quidel as a medical diagnostics company has been in business for nearly 40 years. We sell instruments everywhere from point of care to at home. We do testing, flu, COVID, Lyme, strep, everything. We run these devices worldwide. Azure is playing a big role in how we manage these devices and collect information off these instruments. It's not only thinking about how we're going to deploy them, how we're going to update them, put new firmware on them, control them, do fleet management, we're using Azure IoT to control all of these things. Cardell is primarily a chemistry company, and we're emerging as a software company as well. We're trying to leverage software to revolutionize how we're delivering tests. That's what makes it really interesting, is that we're finding our way and doing things for the first time as a large company that's already well established, but now we're able to take the scale through Azure. So I'm here with Rodney Guzman and Torsten Alhorn. Thanks for taking the time with us, gentlemen. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. The diagnosis space has changed a lot over the recent years, and I can imagine even more so over the past 12 months. Can you share the role Quidel plays in managing test results and how you approach that? Sure. So we collect test results from all of our instruments. We have a lot of different kinds of instruments, everywhere from point of care to at home, and we are aggregate all that data into Azure. That helps us do surveillance, it helps us see how, for example, COVID has been progressing. And in this recent history in the pandemic, it's really been an interesting time for a company like us because we've been around, like you mentioned, a lot longer than this pandemic has been. And so we were seeing all the timelines that we've been planning on just simply shrink up. So things that we were predicting on, for example, getting to scale in five years now, we had to take that down to a single year just because of how much more testing that we're doing right now with COVID. And you have a, a range of products called the Sophia range, which is uh, really a connected device that allows you to get those results more immediately. Now, I imagine there are huge amounts of data results coming through. Uh, can you share what kind of volume of data you're working with and how you manage to process that data? Sure. So we're getting at the moment between 15 to 80,000 test results a day, most of them coming in during the daytime because people are not testing in the evening. So 15 to 80,000 test results coming today, and we are saving all of the test results in Cosmos DB. Using Cosmos on a flexible plan, this means we have a minimum scaling up, scaling down, which works perfectly, especially for night. Also, we're using Azure Functions. Azure Functions, really nice on the consumption plan. Same thing, they scale up tremendously during the day, during the night, scale down, don't provide any cost. It's like really, really cheap, so it works really well for us. Then on the backend system, we have a couple of APIs, like Web API using .NET Core in the container, and backed by SQL Server. And also we're using heavy caching with Redis cache in between, so that the SQL Server is not overloaded. It works really, really well on this part. And with all of this, the data is flowing down, goes really well. And after we have the data on Cosmos, we are using the Cosmos change feed. And from the Cosmos change suite, again, utilizing Azure Functions on a consumption plan to pick up the data and then pushing them into Elasticsearch for searching and there it is and it works. I, I couldn't have imagined building a system like this 10, 10 years ago. It would have been so much more difficult uh, with all these great building blocks in Azure. It really, it really has made it a lot, a lot more feasible for companies like us to, to get some big solutions up quickly. Yeah. That's, that's great to hear. And, and Rodney, I understand that the data you're getting today really represents a, a subset of the potential data you could be receiving. How does that impact how you planned and architected the solution? Right. You know, so regarding the, the subset of data, you know, as we are IoT enabling our instruments into Azure IoT, we're getting more and more data. As we enable even more instruments, we're just going to get exponentially more data. One of the things that we had to consider was, well, with, with a pandemic, since we're getting millions and millions of more tests in, you know, how do we manage for that? And specifically for our at-home products as well, we're going to have a lot of potential at-home users. And so we had to plan ahead. And this is speaking to the, the five-year plan that now came to fruition in a single year. Fortunately, thanks to Torsten and his team, we, uh, uh, we made a lot of great decisions. So we weren't really, we weren't burned you know, by not being able to scale with the amount of tests that we had. So a lot of the a lot of the services that we're using in Azure, a lot, you know, like Torsten mentioned, like the functions and Cosmos and using Elasticsearch to search, 
the Cosmos, all, all you know, the whole piece soup of Azure technologies that we ended up using was all specifically to help us enable scale up and down as needed. Now, while processing that data and being able to scale up and down is important, it sounds like you also need to have a really strong focus on the integrity of that data. Can you share how you architected for this in Azure and how you ensure that no test results are ever lost? Sure. So when we're picking up the data, we are using Azure Function to pick it up from an external source, and then we put it into an Azure Service Bus. Azure Service Bus is our like main part where we move the data through the system, and we also use it there for temporarily store the data. And the temporary means like really seconds. And then after, after we have picked up the data, we delete it from the external source, we are picking it up again with an Azure Function from the Service Bus, and then putting them into the Cosmos DB. Then we are also using the um, service bus trigger that is built in in Azure Functions, like not much to do, and relying on this mechanism to ensure that only data and the service bus is released when we process this and have them in Cosmos. Then after we have it in Cosmos, we're using Cosmos change feed. Same idea, we have an Azure function relying on the Cosmos change feed, picking up the data and then pushing it over to Elasticsearch. So we are using, in this case, once the service bus as our like intermediary storage or buffer to keep our data safe. And then Cosmos is our long-term storage. And again, using Cosmos for keeping the data safe. Also for Cosmos, what we're doing is we're having Cosmos replicated into another region, which is also happening all in the background, nothing to do with us. It's just slowly mouse click and having it even available in multiple regions, which has very helped us very much in the past. And, and really what that means to us is that we need to be able to take different parts of the systems down, down at different times and, and have it messages be resilient to that. We might need to do some maintenance and our upgrades, add new software in here and there to improve things, fix bugs. It is software, there's always bugs. By having all these different kinds of capabilities that we're leveraging in Azure, this allows us to do this with confidence and knowing that we're not gonna lose any messages. Now, we've heard how you architected for this huge amount of data that was coming into the system, as well as how you address things like resiliency by replicating your Cosmos DB across Azure regions. But can you share some of the challenges you faced along the way when you were building out this platform? So Azure Function is definitely one of our main parts in our system, and there's a lot of learning there, especially Azure Function scales up tremendously. Never forget about that you scale up Azure Functions if you have a lot of data coming in that, for example, comes through the service bus and your downward systems like your database, et cetera, gets hammered by it. So you want to make sure to scale, to make it some types of flow control in the Azure Function to ensure that your data is like more like constantly coming in instead of peaks. And this one helps you tremendously later on scaling and using service bus result. So this is really one, like have a look on the Azure functions and how to use them, not just for scale out, but also for flow control. Another one that we're doing is we're relying on CI CD pipelines. Um, I was just thinking back, we never really did a manual deployment of any of our stuff. We always deployed through Azure DevOps, have an CI CD pipeline, and we also started from the beginning deploying to all our environments, so our development, test, and production environment. Even nobody was using production, we deployed everywhere the same code, one after the other. So it was also a very important point, and it saved us later on a lot of headaches because you don't have this issue of like, hey, is my system running in development, but in production it's not running, but yep, everything's there, everything works. Also, another thing that we're doing is relying on our servers. We don't actually back up our servers. For example, if we have a new version or something happens, we just redeploy it. And also for our databases, our databases and every data that you have relying on the Azure backups and doing this one and backing up stuff. So main idea is always don't try to reinvent something that's already there. Just use what's there because the people that are doing it for a living and they're doing it much better than we do. Mm -hmm. And it works and helps us a lot of headaches. And yeah, last but not least, plan for resiliency. Um, because you're in the cloud, there's always something that can go wrong, especially everything runs over a network. So really make sure what you're doing. For example, what we take data out of one data source, putting it in another data source after we're sure we have saved the data there, then we delete it out of the original ones. By doing this, we never had any issues. As we said before, we never lost any data. And the main reason for this one is because we were planning for this from the beginning. And if you follow this, it's a 
nice time and also I don't get cold in the middle of the night, I don't mm -hmm. have a pager, I'm just mm -hmm. sleeping well <laughs> and everybody likes this. And that's great to hear, it's great to hear how you know not only did you manage to take advantage of some of the great features of Azure Functions for scaling up and your, and your flow control, you also really kind of took advantage of you know, some of the other features there as well for that uh, for that you know, ability to build resilience into your platform and and test that as well with you know, being able to redeploy services. Now, Rodney, when we spoke earlier, you spoke about some of the opportunities for managing your fleet of devices at scale. Can you share a little bit about what that looks like and and how you're continuing to push forward with that IoT management across your fleet of devices? Sure. So before IoT, our customers have instruments that are literally spread all over the place. They have offices, they have you know facilities all over. And before IoT, one would have to manually update you know the instruments with new language files, new you know new assays, like a new version of Flu or what you know, or even a new version of firmware. And that's problematic because you never really know what is where. And what IoT enables for us is a couple things. One of them is that fleet management problem. We really want to be able to know exactly what's installed where. We want to give customers that level of control so they can deploy when they want to deploy. They don't have to do any manual effort. And it provides a lot, a lot more assurances of what software is actually running out on these instruments. And so we, uh, we uh, leveraged um, some, uh, the Azure IoT plumbing on the edge and integrated that with Azure IoT in order to support those types of things. The other part of it is, is you know, controlling the behavior of the instruments you know, and doing that not necessarily right on the instrument, but being able to do that in the cloud as well. And where we're taking our fleet management is enabling people to, you know, who own their instruments to make a single change that's automatically replicated down to all their instruments. And that's all powered you know, through Azure IoT. That's really great. Some awesome kind of, you know, insights there as well around not just the, the management of that data, but also you know, being able to manage that fleet as well. Now, one of the questions we always like to ask our customers is, you know, what are some of the lessons you've learned? And you've shared some of those lessons uh, a little bit earlier, but you know, if you were to turn around to someone who is you know, looking to build their own kind of IoT enabled system, um, you know, obviously for a different industry, but looking to build a similar system, what's one lesson you'd share with them or one thing you'd tell them to think about before they got started? What I would say in this case is, Think about what your instruments are. What is the representation of your instrument? And how do you want to represent it in the cloud? And do you have your instrument and it represents certain data, it has functionality, right. and you are uniquely identified. And the uniquely identification is really an important part. You say, this is mm -hmm. your instrument and here it is. Well, I, and I, guess, I guess the way that I'd, I'd answer this is that um, we have to think, uh, I think, a lot of terms in connectivity and what people's expectations are around, yeah. around what they want to be doing with their instruments. These are not just standalone things doing very important things. And you have to, you know, sometimes they have very small screens and they're hard to, it's hard to manipulate them, you know, uh, to do exactly what you want to do. But what if, you know, from a connectivity perspective, if I want to be able to um, control that remotely, that's maybe from a web page, maybe from a mobile app. How do I how do I represent that instrument virtually in the cloud? And that might be manifest through like device twin or something like that. Mm -hmm. Thinking about you know your instruments as having lots of different properties that are that are on that are on the uh, you, you, um, the instrument itself, but now are replicated into the cloud. And once you virtualize them and in, in, into something like a device twin, you can then build other apps you know, to do that kind of manipulation. So I, I dream of a day and we're heading there, you know, one day we'll have our instruments, you know, controlled by, you know, a mobile web app, responsive web app, where I can say, hey, I want to make this one change to all my instruments, boom, you know, and boom, you know, and, and it all happens. And uh, I want to manipulate that, you know, that menu really quickly on my phone where, you know, it's a little, maybe it's a little bit more challenging now. Because um, some of these instruments also, we have to live in the world of, we have a lot of, we have, you know, 70,000 of these things deployed, they've been around for a while, and they're not necessarily as responsive as your, you know, your iPhone. And, you know, so people are more used to those kinds of interactions. Being able to bring that kind of life to our instruments through these ancillary devices like mobile devices is really powerful when you don't have to always think about it living on the firmware of the instrument. Think bigger. You know, <laughs> I think you know, that's the main thing. Yeah. It's like really, you, you extend your instrument to the cloud, and that's what we're doing and really think bigger what can be done and not just trying to replicate, hey, this I have an instrument, this in the cloud, and just do one for one. It's like, 
then you don't solve it. That's that's not the goal. So some really great lessons there on uh, on some of the interactivity and just thinking about that user experience when you're developing those devices and, and how you replicate that to create a, a really great interaction model for users of your devices. Rodney and Torsten, thank you so much for taking the time with us today. Thank you. Thank, thank you for you. having us. That was very nice. Of course, if you want to learn more about anything that's been discussed today from Azure IoT to Cosmos DB to Functions or Azure Availability Zones, you can follow the links on screen now to the resources on Microsoft Learn and get started with all of your free training resources. You, of course, can follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter as well to get updates on the latest episodes. And if you want to feature your own story, you can email us at cttalk at microsoft.com to get started. Thanks again for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you on the next Customer Tech Talks. Hey, hey, hey.